to our feet as we begin our service of praise and clap our hands this morning, this afternoon. Celebrate, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Come on, he's risen. He has risen. He has risen, and he lives forevermore. Come on, celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Come on, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Come on, let's celebrate our God. Come on, come on. Clap your hands, come on and sing. He has risen, he has risen, he has risen, and he lives forevermore. He has risen, he has risen, and come on, celebrate the resurrection. He has risen, he has risen, he has risen. And he lives forevermore. He has risen, risen. He has risen. They come on, celebrate the resurrection, the resurrection of the Lord. Celebrate, come on, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate, glory, hallelujah. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Come on, celebrate him. Oh, come on, sing. He has risen. He has risen. He has risen. And he lives forevermore. Come on, celebrate the resurrection. Come on, that's a drum. He has risen. He has risen. And he lives forevermore. He has risen. He has risen. Come on, celebrate. Celebrate the resurrection. He has risen. He has risen and he lives forevermore. Come on, he's risen. He has risen. Come on, celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Come on, give God a shout of praise. Give God a shout of praise this afternoon, church. Father, we lift you up. Oh,
God, a shout of praise. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Bless your holy and matchless name. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy and matchless name. Come on, give God a shout of praise. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. All of Easter Sunday boils down to this scripture. For I know that you're looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not there. He has risen. Amen. And as the song says, death could not hold him down, which means we have resurrection power here this morning. With that resurrection power, we want to pray and believe that God could do great things uh, here this morning. Let's continue to pray. Amen. For all those uh, who came to the, uh, uh, what's it called, the um, Easter production yesterday, those who attended visitors, pray that God would continue to touch their hearts. Let's continue to pray for all those who are sick. Obviously, Renee's still recovering. We want to continue to pray for Chanel's dad. We want to pray for the baby churches out there, Barry, Kitchener, London, uh, the good testimony from the church in Vaughn. How I many know we've been praying for them? And I did hear that they were able to get a building or a place, amen, to have worship. Praise God. But that's prayer. Amen. So continue to pray for them. And, and he just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that uh, he's very grateful for the prayer that he feels. Them. So praise God for that. Continue to pray for our leaders. Of course, our pastor, uh, Pastor Warner, Pastor Greg Mitchell, Dave Marks. Just continue to pray for them. Keep them in your prayers. And then finally, of course, pray for God's word that it will penetrate our hearts and touch us here this morning. I mean, you hear you'd say, I need to hear from God. I need a touch of God. God needs to speak to me this uh, Easter morning. If that's you, lift your voice. Show me why you come. Let's cry out to Jesus. Come on, let's pray, everyone. Amen, God. We are so thankful. We desperately need you in this place, God. We are crying out for you, God. We need you. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Thank you for what you did when you died on the cross, that you clothed yourself in our frailty and then suffered and died that way. But then you rose from the dead and that you left so that the Holy Spirit could come and help us to live for you. God, please help us, God, to do your will. Please help us in all our troubles. God, please speak to us this morning and anoint the pastor and help us with everything we need, both now and in the future, with the power that you promised to give us. In Jesus' name, God, please heal those here who need healing and our family members. Please comfort those who need comfort. And God, whatever we feel to ask you, please do not feel a grant to whoever concerns in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take time to greet one another. Let's tell someone happy Easter.
great spirit of fellowship. Amen. I know we say Easter Sunday, but this is a Resurrection Sunday. Can you say amen? Praise God. So sit back, relax, and have a good time. We do want to let you know, just in case you've just come in, there are some seats available at front. Just letting you know in the third row as well. And ushers, please, please, you want to help out with this. Uh, you know, if people come in, you want to make sure you usher them uh, to these specific seats. If you could do that, that would be great. And then your cell phone ringers, of course, if you could put it on silent, that would be fantastic. So just quickly, very quickly, we have a lot to do in the way of announcements. Uh, obviously, every single uh, Sunday, 12 p.m., we have our services, afternoon service. Uh, 11.30, we have set up. So if you want to help us, you come and help us with that. And then as well... Uh, we do have uh, prayer at 5.30, and then evening service, obviously, at 6.30. Uh, but this evening, we have something special. We have a treat. We have our Easter production. Praise God. And just letting you know, if you missed yesterday, that wasn't the will of God. It was a good time. Just great, great uh, feedback. Uh, I don't want to give it away. You know, I'm, I'm done. But we are going to have a testimony of what's going to happen. Some of you are like, what happened? I'm not telling you. But we'll have a testimony, we'll help you out with that, but please come to that. But we're going to be a testimony of that in a moment. Our pastor is going to share more about that, of course. But uh, let's move on. Uh, revival, April uh, 19th to the 21st. We're going to have Wesley Pinnock who's going to come preach uh, a word here. It's going to be a great time. You need to be prayed up for that. God's going to do great things. And then as well, we have our Bible studies that's coming up. We've been having fellowships and various things like that, but we're back to the Word of God. Uh, we're back to studying Driven by Eternity, John Bovier. So you want to invite someone out to that, be there. It should be a very great time. Uh, and then as well, we have our conference coming up. Praise God. Amen. And uh, conference, <laughs> there's so much to say about it. All I have to say is make sure you make time to be there. It is a life-changing experience. There's not much people I've seen go to a conference and not come out changed. And so you, got, you want God to change your life. You've been praying for things. Come to the conference. God will touch your life. And then as well, no food or drinks in the sanctuary. And that's in the other room. And parents, watch your children. And that's all new announcements. So maybe wherever you're at, you can come and testify, all right, about last night's production. Amen. As Julian comes. Praise God. All right, church, so last night, as you heard, we had our production, and um, the first thing I will say is for all those who were involved, and even the rest of the church, I'm be very, very proud of our church, just being able to put on something, having so much pressure with a short period of time, and then to come together um, with zero complaining. I haven't heard people complaining about all the hard work that went into this, and then we put it on, and it was such a great pro uh, production, so let's just put our hands together for it all those who put their hands into it. So yeah, it was great. Um, we were outreaching for this um, all over the area. Um, and uh, people actually came out. There was a few visitors that came. Um, and all in all, we had, uh, to my knowledge, one person bowed their knee. And so that's what we do it for, even if it's just one soul. Um, it, it came at a serious price, which sacrificing time, whether it be money or everything that the church has to, you know, provide. And just for one soul, that's what it's about. So heaven rejoice. So let's rejoice with heaven tonight or this afternoon. So if you missed it, like, like we said, it's going to be on tonight. Don't miss tonight. It's going to be really good. So uh, stay tuned. All right. Amen. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for that. And you say, well, I already saw it. Well, we, we don't do it for entertainment. We do it for evangelism. And you, you invite some people out and believe in God for very, very good things. It was a tremendous, uh, tremendous time. Uh, sense the presence of God. And that's what we're contending for. And what a great blessing that was. So I do encourage you to be a part of that. Come a bit early. We're going to pray. Uh, if you still have some flyers uh, on your way home, if you see some people, just stop. Invite them out. A special Easter production this evening, and uh, uh, people do respond to that. Praise God. We're going to receive the offering uh, this eve or this morning, as we normally do on Sunday morning. And what greater uh, 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 illustration can you get for giving than uh, what we celebrate this morning, and that is the resurrection. But in order for the resurrection to occur, there had to be a crucifixion. 
And the life of Jesus Christ, uh, he never asks us uh, and never will ask us to do anything that he has not already done. How many know and understand that he literally gave it all? He literally gave it all. That is the perfect picture, amen, of the heart of God, of the nature of God, of the character of God, of the love of God. He didn't just give it all to, just to, to uh, uh, prove something. He did it because without it, we all split hell wide open. And he said, you know what? They're worth it. I will give my life. And I'm going to be ministering a little bit about that this morning uh, along those lines. Uh, he gave it all. What are you giving? Amen. Anything less than all on the part of Jesus Christ and none of us would be saved. If Jesus had drawn the line somewhere and said, no, that's it. I can't, I'm not going past that line. None of us would be saved. But he said, you know what? I'm going to give it all. I want the ushers to come. What a tremendous blessing. It's a rejoicing, a time to rejoice uh, in uh, all that God is doing. Uh, amen. We celebrate uh, the fact that Jesus gave it all, but not just that he gave it all, but it was accepted full payment. P full payment. It was stamped uh, by God's stamp of approval. And the proof of that uh, was the resurrection. The resurrection was the proof that God accepted the price that had been paid by Jesus Christ for you and I. Amen. And we give out of joy. We give out of thanks to all that he's done. Amen. Because we're so grateful for everything that he's done. Amen. Let's give generously. Let's give joyfully. You can give online. You can give in the baskets. Let's bow our heads. Father. I pray, God, that you'd bless both the gift and the giver. God, I pray, God, grant supernatural revelation, God, of your son and all that he gave. God, cause us to have a like nature as he has and as you are. And that is one of giving. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can give online, like I said, give in the baskets. Let's sing a song. I found a new life. Appreciate that, singers uh, and musicians. Uh, hallelujah. Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. It might not be uh, uh, the scripture that you would normally associate with Resurrection Sunday, but I believe that God will help us to understand. I'm going to put up a picture, and I remember this as a young boy. Uh, because I was alive back then. If you go ahead and put that picture up. One small step for man, <clears throat> one giant leap for mankind. This was spoken by Neil Armstrong, the first man, first human being to step foot upon the moon. It was July 20th, 1969. And it was a it was a monumental point in human history. I can remember uh, we were gathered together uh, in our living room. Uh, you know, people back then all they had was uh, black and white TVs. Uh, there were a couple color TVs, uh, but most of us had black and white. And we were there gathered, probably the most viewed event uh, in all of human history up to that point. Uh, as uh, Neil Armstrong uh, uh, came off the Apollo 11 uh, uh, spacecraft uh, and stepped on the moon. Uh, and that's what he said. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And I thought about that uh, uh, because uh, there's not a lot of people who understand how the space race started. 
And what happened in this space race, I, I've got pictures and things, but I'm not going to, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into it. But in October of 1957, uh, Russia sent uh, a satellite around uh, the earth uh, and it was the first man-made uh, object to circle the earth uh, and it caught uh, uh, America by surprise. Uh, and so three months later, America sent the Explorer uh, uh, a satellite around. Then that space race came. Uh, uh, and then in April of 1961, uh, Russia put a man uh, into orbit uh, then John Kennedy uh, uh, challenged the entire United States uh, to put a man on the moon inside uh, of that decade, which they did uh, in 1969. But the point was this, uh, that uh, the, the, the tension got so bad, uh, and it was called the Cold War. They weren't actually fighting, but they were gearing up for it, and it entered into uh, uh, space. First time that has ever happened, the nuclear war had happened with, uh, in World War II, but now it went to the, another dimension, it went into space. And that triggered the one small step for mankind, one giant leap for mankind, or one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. And I want to, to make the parallel because uh, the spiritual warfare that we are involved in got so bad and there was so much at stake that it had to go beyond the normal. It had to go beyond uh, just the natural. It had to enter into the supernatural. And I want you to stop and think how bad it must have been here on earth for God to look down and say, these folks need help. This is what we're going to look at in Isaiah 59. And we're going to see God's response to the helplessness of man and the, the, the viciousness of the powers of hell. In Isaiah 59, verse 9, and I'm going to minister this, uh, this, this morning, and then we're going to have communion. And communion is always supposed to be uh, it's supposed to be entered into with an understanding of what was at stake and what it cost Jesus Christ to uh, uh, purchase our eternal salvation, and that we would partake of that communion, honoring all that Jesus Christ did, which means we will be willing to forgive and forget. That we will be willing to uh, put things aside and say, you know what, God, I'm going to honor you and I'm going to live uh, in light of what you did on Calvary's cross and in light of the resurrection. Isaiah 59, it is because of all this evil that you aren't finding God's blessing. That's why he doesn't punish those who injure you. No wonder you are in darkness when you expected light. No wonder you are walking in the gloom. No wonder you grope like blind men and stumble along in broad daylight. Yes, even at brightest noontime, as though it were a darkest night. No wonder you are like corpses when compared with vigorous young men. You roar like hungry bears. You moan like mournful cries from a dove. You look for God to keep you, but he doesn't. He has turned away. For your sins keep piling up before the righteous God and testify against you. Yes, we know we, what sinners we are. We know our disobedience. We have denied the Lord our God. We know what rebels we are and how unrighteousness uh, or how unrighteous we are. For we carefully plan our lies. Our courtrooms oppose the righteous man. Fairness is unknown. Truth falls dead in the street. <clears throat> and justice is outlawed. Yes, truth is gone. And anyone who tries a better life is soon attacked. Probably on social media. The Lord saw all the evil and was displeased to find no steps taken against sin. He saw no one was helping you and wondered that no one intervened. Therefore, here's a pivotal point. He himself stepped in to save you through his mighty power and justice. 
He put on righteousness as armor and helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with robes of vengeance and of godly fury. He will repay his enemies for their evil deeds, fury to his foes in distant lands. Then at last they will reverence and glorify the name of God from west to east. For he will come like a flood tide driven by Jehovah's breath. He will come as a redeemer to those in Zion who have turned away from sin. As for me, this is my promise to them, says the Lord. My Holy Spirit shall not leave them. And they shall want the good and hate the wrong. They and their children and their children's children forever. Amen. Father, I pray, God, that you would give us a revelation of your great love, God, and your zeal, God, for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to consider with you the insurrection. Not the resurrection, but the insurrection. I read a quote. It says, mankind, for the most part, is not kind. Mankind, for the most part, is not kind. And unfortunately, kindness is becoming the exception to the rule. The fact of the matter is that mankind is not kind and in reality is in full-on rebellion against God. For all of our, quote, goodness, for all our good deeds, all of our charity and kindness and supposed love... The truth of the matter is uh, that mankind is in full rebellion against God. Our very nature is in rebellion uh, against God. That is the great uh, insurrection. The word insurrection means an act or revolt or rebellion. Or an act of revolt or rebellion. An organized and usually violent act uh, of revolt or rebellion against an established government or governing authority of a nation, state, or other political entity by a group of its citizens and subjects. Also, any act of engaging in such a revolt. That describes... uh, Our human nature against the will, the word, the holiness, purity, and righteousness of God. There was an insurrection in heaven by Lucifer and his angels. They rebelled against God. Grab hold of that truth. They are in heaven. They are in the very presence of God. And somehow Satan rebels against God. He wants to be like the most high God. I want to be like God. I will be like the most high is what he said. And somehow he convinced one third of the angels to rebel with him against God. And most individuals today, and hear me what I'm saying, want to be God over their own lives. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do with my money. Don't tell me what to do with my body. Don't tell me I can't do this or I can't do that. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That is the spirit of the age. And you know what? You can run your own life. But you will stand before God. See, it's the insurrection. This is the Cold War between man and God. Just like in the 1960s, when I was a boy, I remember we were, my father was in the military. We were stationed down in Texas, and the the Cuban Missile Crisis started, and Russia had put a bunch of missiles in Cuba, and they were threatening to shoot and fire them at the United States. Our car was packed. Everything was ready to go because we were within the range. My father was in the military. If they would have pushed the button or pulled the trigger, 
trigger, whatever you want to call it. He would have went to war. We would have went to uh, uh, further away where the missiles couldn't get us. Uh, amen. There was a cold war, and it was about to blow up. Uh, there was an insurrection. Uh, well, it's the same way uh, in heaven. Uh, amen. Satan uh, rebelled against God. Uh, amen. Uh, and he caused one-third of the angels to do that. Uh, and uh, he is still in rebellion today. You want to see what I'm talking about? Tell someone that they need to repent. You can't tell me what to do. Well, the Bible says certain things about sin. If you want to get a hold of that rebellious spirit in someone, mention to them that they're a sinner. That you need to be saved. There is no other option. Hello? Hello? Don't, don't, don't shout me down. If you really want to see how this spiritual cold war or spiritual insurrection, how bad it is, introduce the topic of heaven, introduce the topic of hell, and introduce the topic of eternal judgment. And watch that manifestation. Witnessing to a guy that yesterday down at the, uh, the, the bus station. See, I can pray to anybody I want to. Well, that's true, but that doesn't mean you're going to get an answer. You can pray to a, a stick if you want to. Someone asked me a while back if I felt there was a spirit of rebellion in Canada. There's a spirit of rebellion everywhere. It's our nature. It's our nature. And just the fact that you're saying, no, it isn't, proves it. Amen. Our very nature is in full rebellion against God. And God looks down from heaven in our scripture and he sees all this happening. Uh, this is amongst God's people. He sees all this happening. Uh, this uh, purposeful, uh, 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 blatant rebellion. Uh, amen. Uh, this, uh, this spiritual insurrection. Uh, he says uh, that he's looking down and it's everywhere. Our very nature is in full rebellion against God. Our very nature is sinful, whether it be passive rebellion or active rebellion. No doubt, the parents here, uh, uh, there are parents here, your child uh, has a passive rebellion. You tell your child to do something, he completely ignores you. Or she completely, that's passive rebellion. Or they actively do exactly what you say not to do. That's active rebellion. You did not teach your child to do that. That came naturally because that is our sinful nature. It's that innate part of you that wants to do and is determined to do what it wants to do no matter what anyone says and especially no matter what God's word says. Don't try to look innocent. How many ever knowingly rebelled against God? Of course you did. You lied. You're lying right now if you say you didn't lie. If you say right now, I've never lied, you just lied, and you broke, it, you broke open. <laughs> I'm speaking about Easter. This is why we celebrate Easter. Because Jesus Christ took the rebellion head on, and he won. This is why Easter was and still is necessary. I know my Bible. I know what it says. I know what it means. I know how to properly apply the great truths of this book. And the Bible declares that we are all in full rebellion to God. That we all have a rebellious nature. Some try to clothe it with a religiosity like I did for 20 years. Going to church and acting like uh, I was a good person. Uh, amen. Uh, but I had that secret life that uh, it didn't take too long to become a, a, a non-secret where everybody knew. We have rebelliousness in our very DNA. An organized and usually violent act of revolt or rebellion against an established government. In this case, it would be the government of God. And mankind, and I don't, he said, Pastor, why do you keep saying this? 
I'm trying to make a point because many times people just goes over. Mankind is in full rebellion against God. Rebellion is a violent uprising against a, a government. A rebel is a person who engages in rebellion. Think back with me to Adam and Eve. They are in the midst of paradise. It doesn't get any better than when Adam and Eve were in paradise. God gave them one command of what not to do. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat from all these other trees. You can enjoy all that, but don't eat from that tree. Because in the day that you do it, you're going to die. That's very simple uh, instruction, simple uh, to obey. It's kind of like the sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. And what's the first thing you do? You touch it. The enemy of our soul come, came along and says to Eve, you won't die. Now, God says, uh, <clears throat> don't eat of it. You're going to die. The devil says, you're not going to die. A direct contradiction to the very simple and known will of God. You won't die. God is just trying to scare you. God is lying to you. You don't have to do what God says. Who does he think he is? God? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, he does. And then the devil says, here's the real deal. I'm going to tell you what, what, what. See, don't take your interpretation of the scripture from the devil. <clears throat> he says, let me tell you what God really meant. Here's the real story. Here's what God won't tell you. If you eat this fruit, you'll become like God. In other words, you'll be able to be your own guy. You'll be able to run the show. You'll be able to do whatever you want. Then you get to call the shots and do whatever you want to do. You get to do things your way. No more this God thing. <clears throat> and so Eve bought the lie, took a bite of the fruit, then con and being convinced, uh, then convinced Adam to do as well. And they both rebelled against God together. At that moment, the entire universe changed. At that moment, the enemy had accomplished his greatest victory. Now mankind joined the devil in his rebellion against God. <coughs> it was not only an act, but it changed his spiritual DNA. The devil had rebelled against God and somehow convinced a third of the angels to rebel with him. Amen. Because rebels never, never, ever rebel alone. They always try to bring people with them. Understand that. They always think that the more people who join them proves that the rebellion is justified. That's not true. And the devil had convinced one-third of the angels to obey him. Then he convinced the only two human beings uh, that were on earth, uh, amen, to rebel against God uh, and join him in his rebellion, uh, and they did. And here's an aside and a hint. Stay away from those who rebel against God because it's contagious. And if you not want to know why, read, Rome, uh, read Numbers chapter 16. Things don't end well for rebels. And the only way out of that is to renounce it, repent, and be redeemed. But I want to look at Romans chapter 3. It says, and the scripture says, no one is good. No one in all the world is innocent. No one has ever really followed God's path or even truly wanted to. Everyone has turned away. All have gone wrong. No one anywhere has kept on doing what is right. Not one. Their talk is foul and filthy, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are loaded with lies. Everything they say has in it the stin poison of deadly snakes. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They are quick to kill, hating anyone who disagrees with them. Whenever they, uh, uh, or wherever they go, they leave misery and trouble behind them. That describes a human nature. 
That describes our world without God. That describes our world as God in Isaiah 59. Looked down and saw all that. He said, man, there's, there's none good, no one. How do I save or redeem people like this? Yeah, I read a statistic. An estimated 30% of the internet is dedicated to pornography. I say it's a lot higher because their definition of pornography is not the same as mine. You want to know how bad man is? There you go. The, the, the internet, tremendous, incredible tool. But what does man use it for? What's in his heart. So here I'm describing mankind. God looks down from heaven. What does he see? What does he look at? What does he look for? He sees all this rebellion. He sees all this sin. He sees all these things going on. What was his conclusion? Well, just burn them all up and send them all to hell. That's not God's heart. He said, is there anyone do anything to help these people? That's the heart of God. When we're bound up, when we got problems, when we're going, God, oh, forget it, forget you. He looked down at all of this wickedness and rebellion, and he looks down, he said, and what caught his attention, there's no one, no one's trying to help these people at all. Everyone's going their own way. So he didn't just say, oh, well, I'll just go make a new universe. He says, I'll go down. No one, no one else is going to help? I'll help. There's only one solution. I guess I will have to do this myself. And he steps off his throne. He steps out of heaven. He steps out of eternity. He enters into time. He enters into the human race uh, as a human being born without sin, the only perfect human being ever born that way. Man's only hope for salvation. Understand, if Jesus uh, fails, there is no plan B. There is no plan B. If Jesus just sins one time, one time, we're history. There's no other way to save mankind and still allow mankind to maintain their free will. This is the whole heart of the matter. God is love. That means something. Love isn't little hearts popping. Beep, 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 beep. That's emotions. And they change as quick as they pop. <laughs> love can only flow out of free will. You cannot make a person love something or love someone. God is love. He loves mankind. He wants mankind's love in return. But it must flow out of their free will. And the only way to restore to them free will is go down and pay for the sin myself. When man sinned, he became a sinner. And sin became more than an act or an action. It became his default nature. Our default nature is sin. In order for man to return and get close to God, man needed a new sinless nature. Mankind needed to be born all over again. In other words, mankind needed to be born again. Nicodemus was told this by Jesus. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, of course, how can I be born a second time? Can I return into my mother's womb and be born? Good luck with that, Nicodemus. Because the issue is sin. God, because he's holy, cannot ignore sin. Man, the way man deals with sin is we dismiss it, we redefine it, 
We gloss over it. We ignore it. We pretend it doesn't exist. The old saying, redefinition covers a multitude of sins. But God, because he is holy, cannot ignore sin. The Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see God. The Bible says, uh, blessed are they that are, blessed are the poor in heart, uh, or the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Sin must be dealt with properly. Sin had to be paid for, and the only person who could pay for it is a person who had never sinned. And so God looks down and said, there's no one there who's never sinned. All have sinned. I guess I'm going to have to become a human myself. Uh, and I guess I'm going to have to live a perfect life. Uh, and then I'm going to have to offer myself up as the, uh, the, the sacrifice for their sin. I want you to think about this. I don't know if you ever have. We know that Jesus lived a perfect life. And then he died on the cross. Here's the question for you. Why the cross? Why the cross? Why did he have to die on the cross? Why not something a little bit quicker? Why not something a little less painful? I don't know about you, okay, if I had to die, make it quick, make it painless as possible. How many agree with me? How many want to just go in your sleep? You, just, you know, you just want to wake up and there's Jesus. Wow. Why this horrible, horrific, slow, torturous, agonizing, excruciating death? And understand this. A war was going on. God had said, okay, devil, it's you and Jesus. I'm staying out of this. Jesus as a man. Jesus as God, he defeat the devil every time. But Jesus as a man, okay. And God, in order for Jesus to purchase our sin, Jesus had to go against the devil as a human being and not give in to temptation. Just as Job, God told the devil about Job, you can do anything you want, just don't kill him. But with Jesus, he said, you can do anything you want, including kill him. And the devil, (laughs) and he cooked up this thing. That's why the cross was the most torturous death. He cooked up this whole sequence of events. I got full access to this man, Jesus. And I'm going to show you how holy he is. Are you with me? The devil's aim was to get Jesus to disobey God and sin. If the devil got Jesus to sin, all of humanity is lost. I have no idea how that would work out if it happened, but thank God it didn't. The devil's aim was to get Jesus to disobey God. Jesus as a man bounded by the same boundaries of normal human beings like you and I. Given a free will, the devil was after Jesus' free will because that's what was at a, a, a stake on the cross. To get Jesus to rebel and disobey God, his heavenly father, amen, because that is what rebellion is. It's disobedience, and that's what disobedience is. It's rebellion, and if he could somehow orchestrate the correct sequence of events to maximize Jesus' vulnerability, ability as a human being uh, and get him just to to say that's it it's over i'm not doing it anymore bingo devil wins we all go to hell if he could get jesus to say i can't take this anymore it's not worth it mankind's not worth it all god needed was one man to live a perfect life And then, listen to me, Jesus lived a perfect life. And then God says, will you voluntarily become the ransom for these people's sin? This was a struggle in the garden. Jesus knew, God, he said, Father, if there's any way, if there's any other way, God, God. He says, no other way. See, he didn't have to do it. 
He was paying a ransom. He was paying a ransom. Jesus was the ransom for all the sins of humanity. It was the cross because that was the absolute very best that hell could come up with. Started with the Last Supper and Judas saying about who's going to betray. Is it I, you lying dog? I mean, if you knew someone was about to betray you and they say, is it I? You just reach over and slap them. That's what we would do. That's not what Jesus did. Denial, betrayal, the whipping post. They ripped the flesh off his back. The false accusations, the lies, the utter brutality of uh, the whole process, the whipping post, uh, public humiliation, public mockery, a crown of thorns. Then having his own mother there at the cross to see her pain and his half-brothers, where were they at? They abandoned him. They abandoned their own mother as her firstborn was being brutally tortured to death. And then mocked and made fun of as you're being tortured to death. And not once did Jesus respond wrong. I know mean, it's hard to keep your mouth shut. The Bible says he opened not his mouth. Not to blame God. They tried to give him some pain medicine. No, I got to feel this in full. Because I got to pay the price. And he didn't want anything to mess up his mind. He still had scriptures that he had to, that he had to fulfill. And then to utter those incredible words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I've always thought of that. What do you mean they, did? they know exactly what they're doing? And then he said, it is finished. Into your hands I commend my spirit. That's what we celebrate. 100% perfection. And then he voluntarily became the ransom for your sin. And without that ransom, you and I go to hell. And the resurrection was God's paid in full stamp on the price of sin. The word ransom means something paid or demanded for the freedom of a captured person. The ransom for our sin was a life lived in perfection without sin and then voluntarily offered up as a sacrifice for our sins. I want to, as we bring this to a close, think with me about this entire event from God's point of view. And stay with me for a few moments here. How many fathers do we have here? Stand up. If you're a father, stand up. Stand up. Hey, amen. If you're taking care of your business. Now, stay standing. How many of you that are standing, and if, you, if, you, if you're not, you can sit down, have children? If you don't have children, but you're, well, I guess you couldn't be a father without children. <laughs> Some of y'all caught it, okay. How many here, your child is with you here? Child is with you here. Okay, David, what would you do if I just come over and started thumping on your kid? Would not be a pretty day for me? Huh? Wouldn't be a pretty day for me, would it? No, not a good day. Anybody else? John? No, not bad day. Bad day in paradise, right? And thank God for that. He's put that in us as fathers. Okay, but I want you to stop and think. God had to step back from the son that he loved, his only son. He didn't have any others. And he had to watch. If I brought your son up there and you saw it, he had to watch. He had to watch it all happen. 
Think of the crucifixion from God's point of view. He had to watch his son get brutally tortured to death and not do anything. Not do a thing. Yes, God, Jesus loved us. He volunteered and he, he gave himself because he loved me. But think about the father. Man, they're, they're hitting my son. Don't ever believe the lie that God does not love you. Amen. You can be seated. He watched. The whip, pow. Dads, picture yourself. That's my boy. But you see, he's got other children too that are bound by sin. And Jesus said, Father, I'll do it. I volunteer. That doesn't make it any easier to watch. That doesn't make it any easier. But he said, this is the only way. So you have the love that Jesus has for his father and for us. And you have the love of the father that would restrain himself and allow his son to volunteer to be the ransom for our sins. And to hold back and allow Jesus to purchase humanity. And God's stamp of approval. Boom! Resurrection Sunday. Oh, I so love what my son did. I so love the souls of men and women. Oh, man. And boom! The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can anyone even think that God doesn't love us? The resurrection is the proof that God loves us. It's the proof that Jesus is God incarnate. It's the proof that we have forgiveness. It's the proof that we can be born the second time. It's the truth that we are forgiven. It's the truth that we can have a fresh new start. And instead of insurrection, the Bible declares that we can have a resurrection of our own. Romans chapter 6 verse 5. For you have become a part of him, and so you died with him, so to speak, when he died. And now you share his new life and shall rise as he did. Thank God the resurrection is not just for him. He's the first of many. But there's going to come a day where we're, all those who are living for Christ will be resurrected with him. Amen. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Give the Lord praise this morning. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Don't believe the lies of the devil. Where he says God doesn't love you. He loves you and I more than we could ever, ever, ever even imagine. And this Easter weekend that we celebrate was testimony for that. Let's bow our heads together. Hallelujah. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And we ponder this great mystery. Of the incarnation, Jesus Christ coming down and becoming a human being for you and I. Living a perfect life, volunteering to take our place and be a ransom for our sins. The Father restraining himself, and what I believe was the greatest restraint that could ever be exercised. And the greatest joy to see his son willing to do that great thing. You're here, you don't know God. You know about God, but you don't know him personally. I went to church for, 30, for 20 years and didn't know God personally. I knew all about him, the facts, the information. But there's something about meeting him. And he forgave all my sins. And I experienced the love of God. You say, Pastor, I want that. What greater day than Easter morning to give your life to Christ? You say, Pastor, I don't know God personally. I've not been born again. I 
think I love God, but I just don't know him. I, I want to know how to get to know him better. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I say. And he says, you must be born again. You've got to yield your life to him. We all have parts of ourselves that we don't want to do what God says. But God says, listen, if you'll, if you'll submit that to me, I can help you. And you say, Pastor, I want Jesus. Quickly, slip your hand up. Put it right back down before we go on to other things. Say, I'm not saved. Or I'm backslidden. You turn your back on God. You know, knowingly disobey and live in rebellion to God. You say, you know, I'm tired of it. Listen, God loves you. He wants you to come back quickly. Slip your hand up. Unsaved or backslidden. There's people here. You're resisting God. He wants to help you. People here, you've cried out to God. And this is the answer to your prayer. But you got to respond quickly. Slip your hand up. Put it right back down. Amen. Others here, you're battling that age-old battle. God doesn't love me. Oh, he couldn't prove it a greater way. Couldn't prove it. But the devil still uses it and uses it. And one of the reasons is you're looking at yourself, not God. Yes, you're not perfect, but you can live a righteous, holy life. God will enable you. You need to tell the devil he's a liar. God proved love. His son volunteered, and the father allowed him. That's the greatest sign of God's love. Amen. We're going to have a time of communion. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for this is the Lord himself has said about his communion table. And I passed it on to you before. That on the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new agreement between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death. That he has died for you. Do this until he comes again. So if anyone eats this bread or drinks it from this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he is guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. This is why a man should examine himself carefully before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. And we're going to have communion. And uh, what we're going to do is, is uh, what I would like for you to do is examine yourself. This is what the Bible says. Look what it cost Jesus to save you. And look what it cost Jesus to save the person next to you. And if Jesus was willing to pay that price, then you know what? We're worth something. And what the devil tries to do is he tries to get us to be at each other's throats, for lack of better term terminology. He likes to put a division amongst God's people. So if you've got someone to forgive, you need to forgive them. If you've got someone that you need to seek forgiveness from, you need to seek that forgiveness. If you've got some old grudges that have been hanging around, you need to bury them somewhere far away. You need to renew those relationships. And as we're seated here, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're not going to have an altar call this morning because it gets a little bit crowded. But you say, you know what, Pastor? God's dealing with me about some things that I need to get right. Just slip your hand up. I'm not going to ask you what they are. That's you. Quickly, slip your hand up. Amen. Be honest. Slip it up, put it right back down. There's more people here. God bless you. God bless you. You need to do this. The Bible says, you know, it's, there's a spiritual transaction that takes place. The Bible says, therefore, many of you, there are many sick among you. It said, even some die because of this. Others, there's some things that you got to get right with God and with others quickly. Slip your hand up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Slip it up. Hey, welcome to the human race. 
Others quickly slip it up, put it right back down. Amen. I'm going to pray a prayer, and then we're going to go into the communion part. This is not a forced thing. If you don't want to participate, that's up to you. You can just pass along to the next person. Uh, amen. Uh, 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 but as a, as a body of believers, this is what the Lord commands us to do. It doesn't say do this often. It does say as often as you do this. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that your hand would be upon this time in our service, God. God, that you, God, would knit our hearts once again to you and to one another. I bind every spirit of hell. I bind every spirit of pride and rebellion. I bind every spirit, God, of of, uh, uh, hate. God, I pray, God, unite every heart. God, don't give place, God, for the enemy. God, shine the light of your word. God, cause, God, your people in this building, God, to show forth your great love for you and for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The ushers are here. They're going to, you want them to stay seated? Okay. And so you just stay seated. They're going to pass this on. Don't take it. Wait till everybody has it. We're all going to partake of it together. Okay, go ahead.
I'm going to be reading again out of 1 Corinthians 11. And so for this is what the Lord himself has said about his table. This is what's called a communion. And the Apostle Paul says, I've passed it on to you before. Now, he, he really throws this in here. On the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord Jesus took bread. In our case, this is the symbolic that we're having right now. And we had given thanks to God for it. Father, we thank you, God, for our daily bread. And we're asking your blessing on this time. He broke it and gave to his disciples and said, takes and eat it. Now, in the Middle East, you're not considered friends unless you sit down at a meal together. You can sign all the contracts and do all of that. It's not until you sit down and dine together are you considered close. Take this and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're going to go ahead and eat that right now. Remember what it took to get that for you and I. The Bible goes on to say, in the same way he took the cup of wine, after supper, saying, this is the new agreement between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. This was not a lightweight thing. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you drink it. Go ahead and drink that. He says, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death that he has died for you. Do this until he comes again. So if any of you eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he is guilty of the sin that cost Jesus his body and his blood. That's basically what it's saying. This is why a man should examine himself carefully before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. Amen. God is a good God. God gave everything for you and I. And I know what the Holy Spirit is going to challenge you and I to do. Give a little bit more. I think some of us, and I include myself, sometimes we hold back a little bit from God. That's just our nature. But you have a free way to say, no, I'm not in that anymore. I challenge you. Let God challenge you. Let God challenge you where you would be a living sacrifice for others to see. And learning to love people and learning to reach people for the great God that we serve. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing it through one more time. Then we're going to worship out. Please, with these cups, you can you turn them. Uh, I think it's Richie's got. Is that what that's for? Yeah, Richie in the back. He's got a little bit. Wait till we, after we sing. We're going to sing one more time. Then we'll do that. Let's stand together. Lift your hands. Come on, church. Come on, sing. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you.
this evening to play. We'll have that at 6.30. Uh, building open at 5.30 for prayer. If you've got some flyers, invite some people out. And we're believing God for good things. Uh, Wesley, you close us in prayer.